We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Let me talk about uh, what we can learn uh, from congenital amusia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that we are all born to be musical, uh, and we all are. That is, musical engagement is ubiquitous and emerges early in life. And the best evidence is really that newborns respond to abstract properties of musical pitch and time structure, like changes in tonal key and disruptions of musical beat before the age of one. They also move spontaneously to music, and when moved in synchrony with music, they show enhanced pro-social behavior. So musical engagement is not only rooted in social interactions, but it is also a highly pleasurable experience. And I will illustrate it now with dance. This is not the prototypical musical situation, but think of it, it's really a musical activity. And I'd like you to pay attention to the first row and the last one. And these are the two extremes I'm really interested in. And I'm sorry, but I will turn first to the ones who don't have it. That is, they represent 1.5% of the population, and uh, that's what I'm referring to as congenital amusia. Uh, I call it congenital for the idea that it is present from birth. It defines a likely time period, not the etiology, although we have made a lot of progress regarding this. It, 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 what characterizing them, it's their inability to detect when someone sings out of tune, including themselves, <laughs> to recognize and sing a familiar tune without the aid of the lyrics, and to ma maintain tunes in memory. And uh, what is really fascinating is that it, is emer it emerged just in isol isolation from other disturbances, such as speech delay, intellectual deficiency, acquired brain damage, or even music deprivation. They are exposed to music like we all are. And they have normal understanding of speech and prosody in everyday life. It is also very similar to other learning disorders that you are familiar with, like dyslexia, for example, speech disorders like the one we heard earlier, dyscalculia, prosopagnosia. And uh, why are we so interested by this condition? It's because it is a natural experiment of the neurobiological neurobiolo origins of music, because it is an accident of nature. We didn't create it. And it is a rare chance to link brain behavior and genes and also breakdown patterns reveal how the brain works. And I'll try to illustrate each of these points in a moment. With the, but I have to tell you how we do that. So we go from the behavior to, and I, and I will illustrate it so that you have an idea what it is, uh, from a functional explanation 
to the uh, brain correlates, how it is, what are the anomalies in the brain, to the etiology from the genes to the environmental factor. And I will illustrate it with someone who just wrote a book about his condition. <laughs> Tim Falconer, he is, was 54 when he came to visit my lab and that's where he discovered that he was in music because he only had one complaint is to sing out of tune. And I really invite you to, to read his book, which is a fascinating description because he writes so beautifully as well and has a very good sense of humor. He just appeared last year. But let me illustrate it with his condition uh, because we filmed him several times. So typically, they fail to detect pitch deviance, like here. There are two melodies, and we ask them if it is the same or different. say that was different. I think there was an extra pause in there. Same. And you could see on the face that he couldn't tell. He couldn't detect them. Now the best part. So we play with the melody so that uh, the melody is one semitone apart from the accompaniment. This is really a disorder related to pitch structure. And they are insensitive to this kind of change, while newborns are sensitive to this. They do perceive this change. So let me play to you the first example. And uh, of course, we don't ask uh, non-musicians if it's dissonant or consonant. We just ask if it's pleasant or unpleasant. Like 10 is really pleasant. Yes. Uh, okay. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> and typically we'd say everybody laughs. I don't understand why. And this is really the problem with this condition. They are unaware of what's happening. They have no idea what is wrong and what is correct. And they sing, most of them sing out of tune, and they are unaware of it. It's just because other people tell them that they are, you know, a little bit off. Like, like Tim, he's not really off, as you will see. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mahela. Happy birthday to you. But what is really nice is when we ask him to sing on la la la. La 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 That wasn't even close. <laughs> He knows that he doesn't know what the tune is, but he's improvising, as well as the whole family. I'll give you an example later. But what is really interesting <laughs> is this fact, is that in terms of, I mean, Tim must be average here. Here are the A musics, and uh, we have a large pool of uh, 38 A musics, and the, here are the controls. So each dot represents one, the average of one subject. Each syllable is really analyzed uh, syllable by syllable. And as you can see, they do sing less 
in tune than uh, controls. W 100 uh, cents means one semitone, it, and this is the building block of the tonal western system. It is two ad adjacent keys on a keyboard. And as you can see, they are indeed uh, deviant in, that ter in, in those terms. Uh, but what is very fascinating is that maybe they are out of tune relative to what they should sing, but they are in key. That is, the, to the intervals they are singing are really in the key, or at least as well as control. They don't make so many errors in those terms. And, uh, and what is very interesting is that when they improvise like uh, Tim, they really made uh, fewer uh, errors. So the idea is really we should improvise a little more. <laughs> and it is hereditary. And uh, I'll play just the mother, but this is really a signature of the whole family. I just don't want this to be uh, later on YouTube. Elsie Falconer. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friend. Happy birthday to you. Not everybody does. I mean, that's fantastic about this family because most of them are affected. I mean, these are the black shapes. I mean, most of them are. Of course, a few are not as spared, so we can say it's not really in the environment. It is in their genes. And we knew it is uh, really hereditary. So if you have one relative in your uh, family or in close uh, relative, then uh, there are 30% chance or 10 times at least more chance that you have a risk for amusia. So it is heritable. So we try to identify what are the genetic variants of this condition because it has been so successful for speech disorders. And uh, for the moment, um, it has been without success. The only thing I, I can say, and still it is a negative finding, is that we have no evidence of FOXP2 mutation. Um, so. <laughs> It's like finding a needle in a haystack, but we will continue because I really think that uh, this is worthwhile because it has been found for speech disorders, and likewise, I believe that uh, it, it may provide new entry points to the neurobiology of learning disorders in general, not just amusia. And to do so, what is very important is to know what's happening in the brain. And we do know a lot about the neural correlates of this disorder, because it is a cortical disorder. Here, back to Tim. We measured the uh, accurate fasciculus. This is a major fiber tract, I should illustrate on the right side of my brain, uh, that relates the auditory cortex to the inferior frontal cortex, cortex on the right side of the brain. And as you can see, Tim here is in uh, red, and it's much smaller than a control illustrated here in blue. But of course, you compute that uh, across many different in music cases, and you can compare that to controls, and it has been f found in many different studies that they do have a connectivity issue. So the main um, problem with their brain is a reduced connectivity between these two regions, uh, the auditory cortex and the inferior frontal cortex. And it, uh, it is really in terms of functional anomalies as well as structural anomalies. We do find structural anomalies in the auditory cortex and the inferior frontal or cortex by having more gray matter. Uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, lead to deficits in uh, functioning. And so a working hypothesis explanation of the disorder now is in, in term, at least it's mine, uh, it is in terms of recurrent processing between the auditory cortex and the inferior frontal cortex. And the idea that uh, they do have an intact representation of musical pitch in the auditory cortex, so it, the bottom-up information is reaching really their brain, but they have poor feedback control between the right inferior frontal cortex and the auditory cortex, so the top-down aspect. This is illustrated here. 
And uh, so the information is reaching the auditory cortex correctly, but it is really this loop that is functioning, malfunctioning in their case, so that the auditory cortex is really encapsulated. It's not influenced by the way they are processing or wanting to process. So let me just illustrate that with the EEG recordings. We did use different neuro neuroimaging techniques, but this one is really the most um, revealing in this aspect. And so we presented melodies like this one and asked them if they're in incongruity. Uh, so the first one. You should say that's fine. The reason in congruity, if you are not a music, otherwise you, there is no overlap uh, in distribution. So these are the musics and these are the controls. Each bar represents one subject. But what was really fascinating, and it has been replicated later on, is that we found a negative, early negative response in the brain of our musics as well as in controls here. And while uh, the, we only found a P600, that means that they are consciously detecting the uh, deviance, the pitch deviance, uh, accompanied by a P600, only in controls and never in a music. So we have a clear signature here of what's going on in their brain. The auditory cortex, which is really responsible for the N200, is responding uh, to the deviance, but not, it's not integrated consciously. And it's not a problem of attention because we have uh, designed a situation where where we controlled for attention. In this case, it was a click they had to detect. We replicated the same findings. So this explains why uh, I, I believe it is a question of intact bottom-up information, because the N200, also called Iran or mismatch negativity, uh, seems to, to be replicated and reflect this uh, uh, bottom-up processing, while the feedback uh, revealed by the P300 or P600 uh, reflects a poor control between the right inferior frontal gyrus and the auditory cortex. And it is really a pitch awareness disorder because it's really so high level. Pitch regularities of tonal music are registered and predicted by the auditory cortex of a music without leading to conscious report. Uh, and what is really missing is a normal feedback loop to learn from errors. And it seems that really error corre correction requires uh, intention and, and our awareness. So to summarize, what have we learned from congenital amusia? Here are only the things uh, currently that I think are the most important. Uh, First of all, conscious error correction is really fundamental principle of how the human brain learns, and we are not always conscious of the way we correct ourselves, uh, of course, during learning and uh, when we are very young. Also, functional specialization can emerge from distributed brain networks. It's no longer the case that you can think of the brain like a really focal brain regions. It is a distributed neural network, as I have illustrated. And a developmental anomaly can disconnect the nodes of a network and give rise to severe yet specific learning disorders. And finally, the right frontotemporal connectivity seems to be essential to develop a normal cognitive system for music. But I'd like to finish to end on a positive note because uh, I'm interested in those ones too. Uh, that is the ones who dance so well. And this is really something we are starting, uh, st uh, studying what I believe is the other extreme, the high end of the spectrum, those of the musical prodigies. And I'd like just for you to um, listen to a young uh, Indian uh, prodigy uh, like this one at the age of nine, and I will decrease. And it goes on for five hours. It does, it does. And here at the age of four. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
and at one year, I mean, before speaking. He has support for sure, but I'd like to understand how is it possible to have this kind of performance. So I do consider them as congenital anomalies, happy ones, of course. Um, and uh, because there are recent findings showing that really genetic endowment is more predictive of musical achievement than the number of hours of practice that even the propensity to practice appears to be under genetic influence. <laughs> you laugh, but this is the result of a large sample of twins re, uh, study. And the learning outcomes can be predicted by the pre-existing structural and functional brain features. So I'm afraid if you are not a prodigy, you may not have it. So musical prodigies provide really an ideal paradigm for investigating the neurobiology of musicality, and that to which I'm now turning for the future. So I hope in maybe in 10 years from now to give you uh, a key or the code of something of access or entry points to this uh, special talent. So thank you for your attention.